pick a time and a place, and they'll tell me, and then we fight. The last fight I got in, the other girl's mouth was bleeding. My fight's over when the other person hits the ground. Could they make it any more dramatic? <laughs> How is anyone supposed to take anything seriously or see Lexi here as a genuine human being when you filter everything she says through lots of cuts and effects? Which does arguably sum up the show, actually. Drama over therapy, and I also kind of wonder how much she was encouraged by the producers to say things like that. <laughs> Welcome back. We're going to talk about Dr. Phil again. I am a counsellor. I've done this twice before with the videos you can find in this playlist, where I think I discuss the most glaring issues with his show. Principally, A, it isn't therapeutic in the slightest, and B, it has a questionable cultural impact and he doesn't seem informed on all the facilities he recommends. I wanted to do two things here today though. One being go a bit deeper into some of my concerns about the show, but secondly also give Phil a fair chance, because I'd only ever seen two episodes of this show before and I was obviously just reacting to what I came across in those videos, but it struck me what if I've just seen the worst of Phil? You know, what if most of his shows are a bit more ordinary and less concerning than the ones I've seen? So basically I watched several at random, uh, typing Dr. Phil full episode into YouTube and watching stuff released by this channel here. I also did try to pick ones that said 2021 in a title because I thought that would be fairer, but it transpired most of those titles were a bit misleading and the episode I'm going to talk about is actually from 2013, but <laughs> never mind. After watching a few, I settled for the one that seemed the most uh, ordinary, the one with the least glaring issues that I could easily criticise Phil's show for. I don't want to make a straw man out of him exactly, and I think that should give me space to talk more about the less obvious deeper issues. So I'll link the episode in the description obviously, it shows us Lexi, described as an out of control 13 year old girl. Smoking cigarettes, punching holes in walls, slapping, kicking, spitting. The principal point is she gets in a lot of fights, and I could summarise the plot of this episode now if you want, do you call it a plot when it's reality TV? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. Um, the mum, Rita, is fed up with her daughter Lexi and criticises her as being this monster that's made Rita's life hell. She's just gotten very disrespectful. She has no respect for authority and she just doesn't listen. And I think it's pretty clear what I'd feel about this. You don't just magically get respect from children, not even your own. They learn to respect you through experiencing what respect is, whilst Firm boundaries are important, and I'll never say otherwise. If you get at your children over everything, or show them no respect, or don't listen to their feelings, no amount of discipline is going to work. You end up in a position where you're saying things like, You know, the kids are bad, I ground them, I take away their privileges. Um, it used to work. It used to work until they were old enough to stand up for themselves when suddenly they don't respect you or get on with you. And that's a typical story, I think. Kids get treated like monsters, so that's what they become. In this episode, Lexi is labelled as a ferocious teen, when in reality, Rita the mum is just as ferocious uh, and wrestles her daughter when she's angry, shouts just as much. Do you get upset and yell, shut the f up? I hate you too. When I get to that point like of a anger, big excuse to me. I don't even realize what I say and do. So that's the situation we're presented with, and I think we can already tell the direction this episode's going to go in because it's half what I've outlined myself. I suspect Phil plans in advance what he's going to do when he gets on stage. I suspect there's already an established narrative that he leads the whole episode and his guests in the direction of so that he can frame their entire family life as he sees fit. And the framing here can be summed up in this early moment where, talking about the chaos in Lexi's home life, Phil turns to her and says, That's not all your fault, I'll guarantee you. I know enough about the situation. Tell my mom that. that. Huh? Tell my mom that. It's not all her fault. And so I guess trying to be fair, that's fairly positive of Phil, right? Still not even remotely therapeutic, and I think 
endless chances to educate them or the audience about say a few parenting techniques or talk about the effects of shame on a child something i've talked about extensively in my therapy case study series about a girl called katie or even just how children often express themselves through their behavior you know um if lexi is a 13 year old girl drinking alcohol and smoking weed that won't solely be because her friends do it and it seems cool there's probably a side of her doing out of control things to express that that's exactly exactly how she feels inside. Not that I know the reasoning, you'd have to talk to Lexi to actually find out, but the fact the show makes no effort to do any of those uh, educational things I think makes clear that its intentions are pure entertainment rather than anything beneficial for anybody, and that aside anyway, Phil's focus is less on any of that and more on opening up a space to criticise the mum. And I need you to acknowledge that you are behaving in an inappropriate and immature manner. And that's largely the narrative of this episode. Lexi is behaving bad because you behave bad as a mother. Largely, probably true. <laughs> it certainly contribute to it. Um, and then he randomly veers off halfway through the show to bring in the mother of a similar daughter who's similarly out of control called Jennifer, where the mother says the same things here. Probably to pad out the show, I don't know, we kind of go through the whole thing all over again, introduced to Jennifer's difficult behaviour now and her poor helpless mum who doesn't know what to do, then it being revealed Jennifer has a great deal of trauma in her past, first that her mother was a drug addict while Jennifer was age 7, which no doubt would have made her mum's behaviour uh, challenging at the time for Jennifer, then we discover her dad left when she was very young and refuses any attempts from Jennifer to get in contact, attempts she makes on a daily basis, then that her only male role model, her grandfather, died when she was 10, and ever since she's been stuck in a blocked state of grief where she refuses to acknowledge that he's died at all. So that is a lot of pain, and then we criticise this mum for not taking these huge struggles into account, and attacking the mum for previously being a drug addict. Um, in fact, Phil goes so far to get both of these mothers on stage together and pretty much just tell them off in a big rant. <laughs> Phil goes full whack on these parents. So you have a child in the home whose mother is a drug addict. Do you think that affects this child in any way? She's seven years old, her mother is addicted to drugs, yeah. you've moved her 12 times, her father rejects and her. And you bring your daughter in here and you got the same chip on your shoulder that she does. She is stuck, she is confused, she doesn't know what to do. You cave on every form of discipline you ever try. Are you kidding me? You're modeling the same defiant behavior in the face of authority that she you is. You can't understand why she is so angry. Isn't she horrible? Look at this, all she's doing! It's what you're doing, not what she's doing. <laughs> That's the basic narrative of this though. Kids seem awful, mums complain about them. Let's play Uno reverse and lay the blame at the mother's feet. Um, <clears throat> fair enough, right? Obviously not, otherwise I wouldn't be making rhetorical questions. Um, <laughs> let's get into some of the issues that this episode as a whole raises now. I hope you do like how I'm vaguely trying to structure things, I'm doing this more in recent videos, even if I do still ramble off at points where I get passionate. Uh, let's start by saying attacking a parent for their bad behaviour fixes it no better than attacking a child for their bad behaviour does. You know, it, it still works both ways. If these parents aren't uh, v very good, that's not the right word, but... <laughs> That goes to suggest they're not in the healthiest position themselves to do a better job, you know? Um, sure, that doesn't mean there isn't accountability or problems to be acknowledged or that Phil is wrong at all to highlight their bad behaviour. I'm not saying any of that. The point is, it's, it's never about blame. Not just because blame isn't at all therapeutic. I mean, I've said shaming a child for being bad is unhelpful and is more likely to get them stuck in their ways than to change them. So that same point of shame applies again to the adults. Um, as we'll actually see, criticising these parents doesn't help them at all to understand what they can do better. Following this big rant of Phil's, the first thing said is this. How do I do it? How... You, I know what's important, but I don't know how to do it. And even if he was doing this without attacking them, maybe he's very gently making the rational point, don't fight with your children. <laughs> um, the parents might then agree and think, 
yes, that's so true, and they'll go home with that in mind, and it'll be something they say to themselves, but then the first time there's a conflict, they'll get angry, and that idea will go completely out of the window, and everything will start up just the same as it ever was. They might feel guilty after the fight, but it still happens. What has Phil achieved? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> So not only that, but also it's never ever as simple really as just one person being the problem. There's always at least partly dynamics between people that need understanding. That's a big part of the therapist's job. Not just doing the easy thing and picking a target whose fault everything is, but seeing on a more complex level how lots of different factors come together to create a dynamic that, again, it's not about finding fault for, but just about helping people get out of that dynamic. And I think if you're creating an atmosphere around finding fault with simple targets to blame, like Phil is here, then it's going to be very difficult to really change anything at all. And look, I know some people make the defence of Phil that it's just a simple entertainment show, nobody takes it seriously, everybody knows it isn't real therapy. Whilst that's hopefully true for most people, it won't be for all, otherwise why the hell would they call the show Dr. Phil? We also know there are many stigmas about therapy that the idea is you go and explain your life and the therapist then turns around and goes, right, this is your problem and tells you some intellectual understanding that's supposed to fix it all in a way that feels kind of judgmental and difficult to hear, that stigma persists and it's no wonder when there are shows like this doing exactly that. You know, explaining someone's problems to them is arguably a pointless exercise because A, the therapist won't really know at any deeper level what the so-called problem is, they'll be able to understand a great deal with careful thought but there's still always always things you get wrong and that's why you don't tell the clients things you work with them to figure things out together and b it's very judgmental and invasive and that would make you less likely to take anything in and um c what's the point of intellectualization around your issues if you don't actually take anything to heart sometimes intellectualizing it all becomes a barrier and a defense of its own and I just think it gives people the wrong idea of therapy going into it. Emotions are muddier than that. It's a gradual journey. The therapist kind of sits in a passenger seat alongside the client and um, helps them to drive out along a new path. They're the ones in the driving seat. And obviously were this real therapy, you'd want Lexi to have her real chance to speak and open up about her feelings a lot more and in more depth than we get here. Largely, she's confined to pre-prepared things in video clips and Phil asking straightforward questions that she answers. I don't think she would, nor um, would you want her to really open up on television with a live studio audience because that would be horrifically exposing and untherapeutic, so Phil can't do that, but it would be nice if Lexi could express something or even really just talk to her mum for a bit. If a large part of the trouble is that Lexi and her mum can't get along and are always fighting, surely you need to facilitate some sort of space for the two of them to clear the air and hopefully resolve a few things. We don't get that though. Lexi is only allowed to speak enough to fit Phil's narrative and give evidence for the argument he's slowly constructing and then she's sent off stage. Which is partly where Phil uses the ad breaks to his advantage, because whenever conversation between guests looks like it might be starting to happen, or maybe someone opening up more depth or raising points that don't suit Phil's narrative, he can just shut things down by saying, we'll stop for an ad break here. Because then that kind of ends the conversation, and when they come back, he can start an entirely new subject of discussion based on what he wants to talk about, or he plays a pre-prepared clip that highlights all of the things he wants the guests to bring up, then he leads them down a path he likes before he can move it on again. I guess I'm saying the narrative isn't all just as simple as the mums behave bad, that's the end of it, you know, <laughs> there will 100% be a lot more that we can't even fathom because the episode doesn't reveal any of it, but one glaring question, for example, is what about Lexi's adoptive dad? Um, because her biological one left when she was two months old. Why isn't her adoptive father present for this show? Surely there's a whole extra half of the family dynamic there. What's he like at home? We know from the mum's account that Lexi first started spiralling into bad behaviour when she found out he wasn't her biological dad, so... 
there's clearly something meaningful there, and his only real mention is in Lexi stating, I punched him in the face, but I didn't mean to. Which, you know, perhaps implies she's a little less aggressive to her dad, perhaps there's a level of splitting going on between her parents. Who knows? We don't get to see him. <laughs> um, which isn't because Phil didn't have time in a 40 minute show, seeing as he clearly padded the whole second half by fitting in a story about Jennifer and her mum. So, you know, there clearly could have been time to bring in the adoptive father, but that wouldn't have fitted Phil's narrative. Far easier and less complex to just blame the mums as the bad people and leave it at that. And also, attacking Jennifer's mum because six years ago she was a drug addict? Of course that would have left some emotional scars on her daughter being in a home with that going on, and Jennifer would probably need to express a lot of those feelings and to have that kind of conversation with her mum, but to just randomly attack the mum for something that happened six years ago? <laughs> what's, what's that gonna change now, you know? To be honest, both mums are basically trying to be good mums. The problem is that they feel lost and don't have the headspace or really the understanding to do anything other than fall back into unhealthy patterns. Shame will only cement those patterns. Which is actually the main issue I have with Phil in this episode. Somehow I forgot to mention that so I'm now adding it in the edit. Phil taking their complex family struggles and constructing this clear narrative of blaming the mum is feeding into the general culture of shame and blame that's probably half the problem in the first place. You know, you got the mum shaming and blaming the daughter for everything, the daughter then shaming and blaming the mum in return, the school doing the same to both of them, then blaming the school. This general dynamic of shame that partly may be transference, I think I talked about this in a Good Will Hunting video, how our internal worlds and what we feel of ourselves can sometimes get stamped onto the external and unconsciously people end up behaving in ways that fit what we already expect and feel sort of. The point is Phil's reaffirming all that shame approach and dynamic rather than helping teach them to really understand or to find empathy for each other. So in the way he goes about addressing his simplified version of the issue is then kind of enhancing it even more. What they need is some guidance, some support to let them relieve some of the stress they've been trying to shoulder, they uh, need help facilitating a resolution to the conflicts with their daughters, and they need help finding strength within themselves to be healthier parents. All of which takes time, yes, but is achievable. You can't even do a fraction of that during this episode, but it would be nice to see some sort of attempt. What though is Phil's solution? I think we already know what Phil's solution is, it's the same solution it always is, <laughs> send everybody off to some sort of facility. I think you're in over your heads. They outstrip your parenting skills, and I think both of you need a break from these girls, and these girls need a break from you. No! <laughs> They don't just have a break and that solves it, they've still got major conflicts between themselves and their daughters that need resolving, they need to talk to each other, hopefully in a safe environment to deal with them. Is that really all this episode boils down to though? The problem is you're not good enough parents. <laughs> I mean, what, what does that help? You could say that in any situation then. Parents seek out an expert because they're having trouble with their children and the expert just says, well the problem here is you're not good enough to parent your children. <laughs> Plumber comes over and says the problem is you don't know how to fix the pipes. Cheers for that. <laughs> so he settles for a simplistic answer that can make him look all knowing. Like I said in my first video, um, he could go deeper and raise awareness to the many complex issues of any family that can't get fixed in a single meeting, but can at least be given some awareness and build some sense of hope for the future from that. Or he could simplify everything down enough that he can make himself look very clever by saying this is the definitive problem. <laughs> and not just because that makes him look great, but also because it gives the audience their neatly wrapped up ending. I think this is what the producers want, a show where the audience don't have to go away thinking anymore about it, they can just feel like everything's been resolved and we can relax. Anyway, he packs the daughters off to some unexplained branch that they've both got no objections about whatsoever. And both the mothers say thank you and seem incredibly grateful, but they don't know what they're agreeing to. 
I find that bizarre because what is this facility? They've got Kristen Hayes here to explain, but it's literally like, you know in school when you're giving a presentation you haven't prepared for, so you waffle a load of random stuff? It has a clinically sophisticated treatment um, that has issue-specific groups for uh, preteens and teens dealing with mental and behavioral health issues. Oh, clinically sophisticated treatments, well. <laughs> And that's issue specific groups for preteens and teens? It helps them to identify the limiting beliefs and um, unhealthy behaviors. What the hell does any of that mean? <laughs> Can we not be told exactly what the treatment is, you know? What they're put through here and things, not just shown some nice leaflet picture of two girls sitting by a lake. Because in light of the whole Danny Bregoli stuff, I wouldn't trust sending my child to any facility Phil recommends unless I've seen it myself and know what happens and I'm able to visit regularly. But there's a weird manipulation here where the mothers get broken down by Phil telling them off, which leaves them feeling small enough to believe anything he now offers and... Nowhere in any of this are they encouraged to work through their feelings or find power within themselves to be better parents, just told that they aren't good enough and that they need help. You need our expensive facilities. And I guess, whether intended or not, that becomes the message to the audience. We can't give you any advice to end the episode about dealing with these issues because the only answer is that you need our facilities. You, parents at home feeling similar to this and struggling, you need to send your kids off somewhere expensive and let us take care of it all. That's the only cure. I hope my criticisms there don't sound like these parents don't need help, because they do. They clearly feel lost, and it will take some solid support, and I obviously think therapy is a great thing we could all benefit from. Granted, you need to find a type that works for you, which the comments in the past on my videos have led me to believe is harder than I previously thought, particularly in America, but still, none of that's to say help isn't important. Nor that treatment facilities aren't good, because they can be cray. I've not worked in any myself, however some of my tutors while I was in training did, and I suppose my point is it's about being informed about the support you're receiving. Which is what therapy is, ultimately. Support. It's not some all-knowing, all-powerful figure you're supposed to depend on wholly and bow in total appreciation at his feet with endless words of gratitude. Yes, yes. thank you. Just something you thank can you embrace. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, now. Because that sounds incredibly disempowering. Which again, I think is part of the stigma still existing about therapy. I think it's meant to be empowering. It's meant to help you find strengths within yourself. Not to say you are bad parents who need help, but that Let's work together to reach a point where you feel on top of it all. But you know, this show is interested in entertainment. Never mind what ideas that gives people about therapy. They wanted to take parents who were unfairly critical of their children and then make a humiliating example of them, despite the fact this show itself is also unfairly critical of the children. It labels them both ferocious teens, for God's sake. Um, there's God knows how many other episodes where struggling children are dehumanised as monsters via overly dramatic film clips where Phil often then does criticise them. In that sense, it's no wonder these parents came on saying the things they did about their daughters. The whole show led them into that, just so we could make a spectacle and the audience can get an easy answer they don't have to think about beyond laughing at some bad parents. I don't hate Phil McGraw, he's no different to any other reality TV star, and this is a show put together by a team. I just think his show is 20 or 30 years out of date. I think Jeremy Kyle was several decades out of date when that was cancelled in 2019, and Phil is even worse. I just feel like we're supposed to have moved on from this stuff as a culture now, and so Phil feels a bit like a relic just about clinging on still. That's all I wanted to say though, um, again I'm going to plug my Katie series about a therapy case study written like a novel by renowned clinical psychologist Dan Hughes. I go through the book chapter by chapter looking at the life of this troubled girl Katie on her way through foster homes and therapy in a firstly sad but ultimately incredibly wholesome, hopeful, educational story. There's a playlist to that or to my other Dr. Phil videos but just in general, <laughs> do whatever you want, you know, like this video if you liked it, comment if you think I missed stuff or was wrong, subscribe, support me on Patreon even, but otherwise, hopefully see you next time. As ever, a special thank you goes to Devin, Kestrel, Arwen, 
Stephen Legg, Janice McMahon, Samara Salsi, Sharikov2814, Joshua C. Follier, Chad Bramwell, Incomplete Sentience, and Emily Taras. Thank you.